Steady enough scrum for Blade to get it out. Connick get it out into the hands of Daly. Daly gets it back to Carty. Carty never thought the pass was on. Then he whips the pass all the way out to Matt Healy. What a pass from Carty. And what a try from Matt Healy. Wonderful start for Connick at Toman Park. Four and a half minutes gone. If they were to have any chance, they needed to start fast. And they have done so. Pick and go from Casey. He almost caught Connick out there. Bealham took him down. But he's only a metre from the line. Less than a metre. Munster trying to just drive in around the fringes. Oh, they're so close. They're half an inch from the line as the ball is presented to Munster who trail 7-0 surely they'll get the try this time can Connick hold them up again they're almost there yes they are around the fringes Connick just eventually wilted and Munster have done enough to get the try it's taken them a long time and it's a man we were just talking about Mr Cronin the loose head prop job done 7-5 with a conversion to come a chance for Porch so little chance for John Porch today he gets the ball and launches Gary Owen that's not where he wanted to go I think it's gone infield it's brilliantly taken by Haley, and he holds off the tackle of Heffernan and chases ahead now kicks past uh, Tiernan O'Halloran who's standing still and on he goes Haley's going for the line oh what a try he's had an incredible second half and Munster have absolutely carved Connacht open and when I say Munster have I mean their full back Haley. he has just absolutely scored the try of the day okay. steady ball Here's a they're not going to gain much but they're going to have a good platform Paul Boyle bursts off the scrum and goes towards the post he's tackled by two monster men he's trying to recycle the ball Munster slow and rolling away to get away with it Blade gets it out good carry from Anger a little bit high in the contact perhaps but he gets an extra bit of leg drive brilliant from Anger ball presents itself well Connick looking for the equalising try in conversion that's a lovely old carry from Oliver he pushed a little bit for the extra metre didn't get it Connick pick and go at the fringes they're in they're over the line they've scored the try Paul Boyle what a score! What an answer from Connick. 17 minutes to go, 17 15 with a conversion to come. Good tackle from Butler. Aki's coming through. He's been told he's fine. He's picked up the ball and he's given away a penalty. His problem there. But you can't play it in the rock. The ball's still oh, in the rock. That's tough on Bundy Aki because when he was told by the referee that's fine, you have to have sympathy for him. You're finding him through the middle, but still a rock, you can't pick the ball up. Okay. Hey, it's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. I'm Rob Murphy. Toman Park. Lights still on as we look at the screen from our place in TG Carr Studios where we do our uh, commentaries uh, thanks to a tremendous link up. I don't know if we've mentioned this enough times on the podcast, but we should do so as we start this podcast. Alan Deegan, uh, just during the COVID times with lockdown, we decided even to home in park we won't travel to. We'll just keep it, keep our, dis- our, our traveling uh, patterns the same and uh, our setup is perfect here. It certainly is. And thanks to Alton here in TG Carr who got us going tonight. There was a slight hiccup early on, but uh, we picked up the air commentary at one stage, but Walton got us sorted out. And um, yeah, thanks to him. And of course, Neil, who allows us in here in the first place. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And a great link up between two of West of Ireland's biggest media operations, Galway Bay FM and TG Car. William Davis, welcome along. Good evening, Rob. I was getting very, I, was, I feel very uh, pumped. I don't know why. Oh, look, can I just say, I, I don't know how to feel right now. I just don't know how to feel after that. Honestly, I'm just very, absolutely right in the middle boat. Lots to be positive about, lots to be negative about. It's another loss in Solomon Park, but I don't, I'm not quite sure how they, well, I, I know how they lost it. Uh, great performance. If they win next Saturday, it doesn't matter, to be honest with you, in terms of points for the, the season. Um, but they're going to have to reflect that it's another one of these tight games uh, that just didn't quite go their way, and they, and they will break it down. They they mightn't even break it down this week. They look at this game later on. They they'll be focusing on Edinburgh, but they look at this, mm-hmm. and there are small things they'll have to correct. They did an awful lot right tonight. Some of the players had really really good games. Gavin Thornbury stood out. Massive game. Mm-hmm. They destroyed the Munster line out. They were competent in the scrums. And it, you know, three a three point game is a three point game. You can you can talk about referees' decisions and situations all the time, but um, I, I I yeah I agree with you. It's a hard one to quantify because normally when kind of go to Thoman Park, you come away with a, a twenty point defeat. Yeah, I heard Alan's stats during the week. He even recentified them for me, and they were they were that's a word I made it a word, <laughs> and they were not impressive. So yeah. That's, I guess, part of the reason why you feel relatively positive. Can I, can I jump in here, William? Because you were in the middle of a thought there, but come back in. Alan, let me put this to you, though. Let me give you four names. Peter O'Mahony, CJ Stander, Tyg Byrne and Connor Murray. That's just four names who started 
at the sports ground and Troy and Dee and Andy started that day and had a great, a great game as well. But like those four names in particular, I just want to focus on because they weren't there today. And just, and Connacht, I feel, were even better as a starting lineup in terms of closer to full strength than they were at the sports ground back in January. So I guess you have to factor that into your top process as well, don't you? You do, but that was still a hell of a, still a, hell of a, a, a game by Connacht today. Like they were, they were, if they'd won that game, I don't think anyone from Munster could have complained about it. Yeah. Um, and you there's go, something about Munster too that we never spend too much time thinking about who they have out in the field because over the years we've just learned to take them as Munster and it takes a lot to beat them whoever the field yeah but they brought Dale Andy off the bench they brought Klein off the bench yeah John Klein off the bench and Joey Carberry off the bench exactly so it's not as though they, they were yeah, no I get that but I just feel the need to say it because yeah, you yeah. just wonder is there more of an opportunity missed tonight than maybe even at the sports ground at Christmas well clearly not because the game was in their hands at Christmas But yeah well like if you look at Christmas you know um Monster should have won that game easily. Oh, good point. They dominated that game. <laughs> yeah. They completely dominated that yeah. game. It was only that, that last sort of five minutes that it all, all went to hell for them. Yeah. Um, and then Connor could have won the game at so the end. I could never... about the chaos at the end, yeah. really. Yeah, exactly. For me, it's a game Connor could have won, not should have won. Um, whereas tonight, th- th- it could have went either way. And as you say, it's a referee decision. Bundy goes through a ruck. The ref says, you're OK. Bundy goes to pick up a ball. He should know the laws. If players know the laws, they don't make those mistakes. Good counterpoint. And that's the way I look at these things. These are professional players and they should know the laws every bit as well as the referees. They've simplified the law book about three years ago. There's a lot less laws out there. And it's it's in the ruck. The ball's in the ruck. We had to learn one there last week uh, on the podcast, as you as you informed us. But yes, no. All I'm saying is that it, it's it's to me that's the lesson from there. Yes, the referee said it, but in Bundy's mind, it should have been. But it's still in the ruck. I can't touch it. He's done what you have to do, which is disturb the the process of them getting the ball and slowing possession down. Because the whole idea of going through the middle of a ruck and going through that is to slow possession down to allow your defence to get into place to stop them from being able to recycle the ball quickly so he had done that there was no need to try and pick up the ball and his yellow card that was a bit tough I have to say I thought he was trying to catch the ball he knocked it down if he'd knocked it up he would have been okay I'm not sure about the yellow card I think he knew he was in trouble because he picked the ball up and then he was whacking it on his head and I think he was thinking if it if it had been slightly further away from Casey, I think it might have been better. But his body it, position was so unusual, though. Every deliberate knock on you ever see is a guy reaching out to block a pass. He was like, I don't think, like I think if he hadn't touched it, you said it. He could have nearly put his body in the way. Yeah, if he'd need it, or if he'd put his boot through it. But but if you if you watch it, if you watch it closely, he his hand actually tries to grasp it. Oh well. That's you know, a whole he, other actually holds, he actually tries to grasp hold yeah, of the ball. I still, I still take it as a deliberate knockout without yeah, question. Yeah, uh, but I'm going. Williams going yellow card. I'm go, Alan's going no yellow card. I, I think we'll all just settle on the penalty. I'm going with Alan. Decision made. Let's re- <laughs> replay the game. Replay the game. <laughs> I also have my opinions on the uh, coming through the rock, which you'll, I think our listeners will pick up from the question I asked to Pete Wilkins. How about we go to the post game? I know it's just a bit dropped in there, but let's do this. Gavin Tormey as well, man of the match. Oh, Alan doesn't like that, but he doesn't mind it when it's Gavin Tormey getting a bit of recognition. No, he still doesn't really like man of the match awards. Pete, I'll start with you. And I mean, a lot went right there. So the results just, I guess it's really disappointing. Yeah, a lot did go right. And, um, you know, just been in that dressing room now, telling, telling the players how immensely proud we are of them. Um, you know, we had a really clear plan about how we wanted to play the game. And in fairness to them, they stuck to that throughout. Um, and our only other demand before the game was that if they got an opportunity to back themselves and, and to absolutely go for it, and, and to a man, they did exactly that. And from the charge downs, uh, you know, from, from taking on their opposite man one on one, from backing themselves on on their kick chase, I just thought they really fronted up. And um, yeah, the last ten minutes, probably the momentum got away from us in terms of the penalty count and a couple of those offsides, um, and that eventually told. But um, but it was an incredible effort. We're very proud of the boys. Uh, yeah, you had the platform. Bondiaki sin binning was a key moment in the game, but you did really well to defend it. So I guess there was lots of momentum swings and you had to answer it on a lot of occasions. Yeah, there were lots of momentum swings. And, you know, we, we came down here knowing that um, Munster were going to have their periods of pressure. You know, you're not going to come to, to Thurman Park and, and then not have periods of momentum. And it was about us digging, digging in and weathering the storm and making sure we... We demonstrated that we trusted our systems during those periods of pressure. I, I thought we did that really well, including that period where Bundy was off the field. Um, and probably the only time, as I said, it got away from us in that last 10 minutes where when we did get those momentum swings back in our favour, we weren't quite able to back that up with another positive moment. It, it was an immediate swing back the other way. And uh, so credit to Munster, you know, they, they built on that. 
I have to ask about the uh, Bundy penalties. Just we're, we're lucky enough on the commentary to have the ref link and what threw us and I think what threw Bundy was the referee says you're okay and I think that made him believe he could pick up the ball. How much sympathy do you have for Bundy in that situation? How much frustration do you have with what, with the outcome? Um, I mean, clear frustration with the outcome. I was talking to Bundy there as he came off the field. We didn't actually have the ref's mic in the coach's box, but he said exactly the same thing. He said the ref's communication was that um, you know that he was good. Now, maybe he was talking about the other players that were barging through the space rather than Bundy himself. Um, you know, Bundy and Dave Heffernan and nearby, you know, both took that as meaning Bundy was okay to play the ball. So, you know, in terms of us reviewing those moments, if the referee's not said anything, you know, we'll be pretty critical of our guys. They've, they've got to wait till they've given a verbal or clear. Um, and on that occasion, they were convinced they had been. So, you know, something we'll look at and review, but, um, you know, it, it wasn't reckless in that sense. They, they thought they had clear communication, but, but obviously in this case, it was, uh, it was not the case. Pete, there was so much in that game that we could talk for ages. So I, I'll just wrap it up here and, and we'll get a chance, up, obviously, uh, to chat to you more during the week. But just like the significance of, of the, po- or, sorry, the positive benefit that you can get out of some elements of that. Are you going away, do you think, with like the glass half full type situation here? Or do you have to kind of just accept that this is a real missed opportunity? Um, look, it's a bit of both, to be honest. I think, you know, we came down here determined to win the game and, determined to chase down Munster at the top of this conference and, and that was our motivation and it was something that we thought was was more than feasible for us in the way we prepared in terms of the squad that we picked and the game plan that we had so in that sense it's incredibly disappointing and you know obviously at this stage you feel a bit deflated by that but as you said in terms of the players actions and their approach to it and the way they stuck at it um, you know we couldn't be prouder and um, if anything you know set a benchmark coming here whether there's a crowd here or not you know you come to venues like this and put on a performance like that um, you know, you've got to take the positives from that and you've got to also then maintain that standard next time we're out, whether it's at the sports ground or elsewhere. So, um, you know, we've raised the bar again, I think, and, and it's important now that we uh, we maintain that, certainly over the next couple of games. In England. Speaking of maintaining standards, Gavin Thornbury, you've got the man of the match today and well-deserved. So, first of all, congratulations. But do you feel like your game now is, is having a real impact on, on the opponents as well? And how happy are you with your own performance today? Yeah, I think, um, look, I think a couple of things came off me today. Um, obviously, the line of G stuff with just me is a whole pack off effort and just always happy to be the one going up. Um, and then the charge lines, like, they can go either way and um, they happen to go my way tonight. But uh, yeah, look, obviously, good with the results. You know, from then here, you're going to have to play for 80 minutes. I think we just missed out on that. Um, so, you know, from then here, you're going to play for 80 minutes and you're going to have to have pretty good discipline. I think we just missed out on both them. So, um, obviously, completely good with it. Yeah, it was a real battle out there. You know, it's again for the second time as well. You can pretty much say now 160 minutes against Munster in 2021 and twice they've just got the one score win on, on Connacht. Yeah, I think all year they grind out results. Um, when the couple of their results have gone down to one, the match grind out was grinding their win out. And in fairness, that's what they do. So uh, fair play to get the win. But we'll look at ourselves and see what we can do better to move on to next week. What do you think is working at the moment for Connacht as a pack? What What are you taking away from this from a positive perspective going into the Edinburgh game in, in eight days' time? I think when we have real trust in what we're doing, that, that's working really well for us. And that when each of us are doing our own job, that works really well for us. Um, and so I think we showed a little bit of that for most of the game. Um, so we're coming towards the end there. Obviously, we, we slacked off a bit, but um, no, I think a lot of it was fairly positive. And just just on that, you know, as you say towards the end, is that what you take away from a negative point of view most or, or certainly from a work-ons point of view, uh, just the way that game got away in the last 10 minutes or is it a discipline issue or are there any other issues that are kind of nagging at you now as you think about it? No, I think just, you know, they're going to have to play for full 80 and you're going to have to give you the full 80. And in fairness, the last game, massive effort tonight. You can't, can't fault that at all. It's just like, you know, you're going to have to probably make right decisions for 80 minutes in here. Like, it's a very tough place to go. Uh, they got a really good record here, so... Um, tonight was just not our night I think Coming back from the interviews there yeah look I, I just a good point by Alan earlier and I think uh, will we just wrap up the referee I'm going to give us 40 more seconds just to finish this and Alan's made his point so I'm going to bring it to William you made your point on the Bundyaki coming through the rook and it's a, a very very well articulated point I still make the case if a referee is right there and says you're okay it's an unfortunate breakdown of communication I feel very sorry for the referee I feel sorry for Bundyaki at the very least can we settle on it you can't give him too much grief over that No I, I, I don't think you can because the law is pretty explicit it's a, it's a complicated one 
he may not have even been talking to Bundy, which even further complicates it. Well, I'll just say, just from listening to him, he did say to Bundy, no, I was saying you were OK to come through the ruck. I was not saying you could pick the ball up at the breakdown because it's still a ruck. Well... That's hard to interpret. That is interpret. very... And it, look, it happens in a split second. Um... But look, it's the three points that cost the game. I'm sure there's there's other incidents that oh, you... Alan, well, Alan's still in the referee chat time. No, no, well, no, actually, I'm going to say it, it wasn't the three points that cost the game. That What cost the game was the unfortunately bad kick from John Porch, which set Mike Haley free. Ooh. And that's seven points. And that was, we had the ball. We had the ball and we kicked it away and we didn't protect it properly. And we didn't protect our line properly. And Mike Haley scores a, a try from absolutely nowhere because, as we always say about Munster, they wait for mistakes and they pounce. And they are brilliant at that. And they deserve to win because they can do that. I think of the first half too. Connick turned them over on their own line. Big, big win. Really good work. Great good defensive mall. Then uh, comes out and I think it was Aki who came over the ball and we win, win the penalty. And what happened next, William? I've forgotten. They had a line out on the edge of the 22 and Connick turned over the ball again and gave a penalty away, which was even more important uh, by falling on the wrong side. And it was the first of a very consistent uh, interpretation of the breakdown. I can't remember which player it was. I think it was, uh, I don't know. Let's not blame anyone because I can't remember. It could have been Heffernan. Could have been Heffernan. I think it was. Well, but the point was, it was even you wouldn't even be too critical of him because it was just a learning moment. But that's where they got the platform for the first try. So again, you make the mistake. Exactly. And that's what Munster are particularly brilliant at. You have to say, the work rate that Munster every time you watch them their work rate is incredible and especially in the second half in the, the last 15-20 minutes every time a Connacht player got a ball there was two Munster players yet when if the ball got moved along quickly there were still two Munster players that's real really good hard work see how quickly they sorted out their Alex Wooden problem he gave them hell for six minutes and then for the rest of the game they, they had a mark absolutely and that's you know that's the intelligence they have on the field the rugby intelligence is, intelligence is fantastic and and you know, you have to give them full credit. What I'm happy about is that Connacht were competitive with them in Thoman Park for the first time since 2015. Yeah, I, I take that and I share your view. And I also think that you uh, you summed up the game really well in terms of uh, the contest and the difference between Christmas and now and the reasons to take positives from it. Negative, right? Negative, William. Coaching decision. Here's my thing. Alex Wooden, we're, we're kill telling people. 10 tries from 13, right? And what I think we do too much in Connacht is we find the negatives. We try and we try and balance things out. We say, oh, but Wooden, is he defensively good enough to be playing for Ireland? You know, and I just don't think the other provincial, I don't know, media and fans analyse their players as negatively as we do sometimes because we're just trying to find reasons why they don't get attention. But you know what doesn't help Alex Wooden's cause for Ireland, for example, or for getting the attention he deserves for his incredible attacking play? Getting dropped for the biggest game of the season so far. It was a tactical decision, we think, more than anything else. But I don't think it worked. You talked about it at the end. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I was surprised by it. I, you know, to me, John Porch has been playing at fullback all season. Uh, and I think he was desperate to get into the game. He couldn't get access to the game. So that's, you know, he, he, the kick that he got wrong, he thought, I'm going to kick this, I'm going to chase after this, I'm going to win this. He didn't, because uh, it was a poor kick. And I think you need finishers in games like mm -hmm. these. Matt Healy got one chance in the game, yeah, and he does. scored. Yeah. That's how you win games, you, you, you know. And Wooten, when he came on, now maybe they would have controlled him, we don't know, but he... He didn't get the chance, and when you're flying like this, I thought it was a it was a peculiar decision to drop him. I just uh, and he was dropped. He was dropped to the bench. He came on. I reckon he'll be starting again next week, and I think John Porter will be back at fullback. Brilliant impact. Uh, we're not denying that Alex Wooden is not the finished shark. He didn't play that well against Benetton. Who played well in that game, though? No one. Alan, sorry, jump in. No, I was going to say who played well against Benetton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah I'm, I'm always a believer, and any time I've coached teams. My belief is that you, you keep your most creative players on the field. If they've got weaknesses, get them help because it's much easier or it's much more difficult to create than it is to destroy. So if you've got someone who's got a weakness, then you, you work around it. You hide the weakness. You, you cover it up in some way, shape or form, but you keep them on the field because effectively he was dropped for Tiernan, who was really good against Munster in the A game a couple of weeks back, but I didn't see what he brought tonight in all honesty I, well, I'm not sure it's just about oh Tiernan wasn't good enough either I think it's just about what William's saying it's just yeah, about yeah. why change the shape so even yeah. even if Tiernan delivered on all the, the the metrics if you like that they wanted from him I, I don't understand the shift and it definitely it definitely didn't work looking at the impact that Wooden had at the end of the game I mean it was more a case of God we were missing that as opposed to it's good to have that now yeah yeah he frightens people he's got pace he frightens people and, and that's what you want you want the opposition worried 
mm. you know, because they, they, they weren't worried for quite a while and then all of a sudden they got worried because there was pace on on the field and, and that's what you're looking for and, and hopefully we'll see them back on the field again next week for a massive game because you do want to finish as high as you can. Do you know what frustrates me and we can say this with our parochial hats on but like a lot of observers are going to look at that game and go hmm Mike Haley's a really good fullback and what we know and everything we've seen this season is John Porch is a better fullback than Mike Haley parochial hat, hat on absolutely convinced of it yet uh, they can easily come back and say really? Well your own coaches didn't want to play him in fullback in a big game. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, Haley's, I think, is quite a long way from the Irish setup, and obviously, John Porch can't be part of it. Um, I just think Haley suits Munster. I think that's. Okay. He, he fits their defensive pattern, and. He, yeah, my point wasn't that he's not. He's good, he's solid, but it's just, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that point, but at the end of the day, Haley's finished up on the winning side, <laughs> and that's, 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 that's where it comes back to. Oh, monster. <laughs> and credit to them, and I think Alan summed that up really well. I like to finish on a positive. I like to send people home happy. Not always, if we're not doing well, but kind of are doing well. William, to start with, they're second. I think you said it too, and I just want to ask you about this to see if I was right in what you said. If they win against Edinburgh, you can put this to bed. Do you feel that way? Are you, do you feel strongly that the Edinburgh game now is that important? that like you'll take this as a positive they win against Edinburgh yeah because they're guaranteed second place then and they've won they've won another game and they've won a home game and they've beaten will be beating a side that they don't that they generally struggle against Edinburgh can usually be very very competitive it's all about winning games at this situation the Rainbow Cup is coming Challenge Cup is coming I'm very excited about that yeah Challenge Cup is coming but the Rainbow Cup is going to have there's going to be some pattern to how you play your games in the Rainbow Cup do you have more home games than away games mm. Well, I would prefer more away games right now. Uh, yeah, but the, the the away games mightn't even be that much away. You could be playing a South African team in Dublin, and you could be playing, I don't know, Leinster. The the thing about it is, if you could get four home games mm. and three away games in that, you might. It it depends with Connacht. I don't know. Are they better home or away? Are you more kind of focused on the Rainbow Cup than the Challenge Cup right now, or do you do you just see the opportunity I do with that competition? I think the Challenge Cup depends on where you're drawn. If they're drawn away in England, I can't see them winning. I'm sorry, they just don't do it over there. When did they last win in England? Uh, I think it was Worcester. It was. It was Worcester in 2008, 2009, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know off the top of my head because there's just so many victories over there. There's that one and there's Northampton in 96 or 97. So, you know, it's just so hard to think of these yes, things. Yes, that's a long list of victories in England. What is it about England? Okay, enough of that. William was on the train of thought there and I whipped him off it. Back on it. Um, Rainbow Cup. Uh, yeah, I mean, you just kind of tying it all together. You're just wondering where the season's going, and you want to see nail down second vital. If they slip to third, will William be very, very disappointed? Yeah, because I think that'll it'll affect them next year in the Champions Cup because they'll get a worse draw. I uh, think it's vital. It's not like just a minor thing. This is crucial to what no, you do. I, I think you can get a better draw. You can you can have access. To you don't have to play Racing in Bristol. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that would be a good example. Look, Europe is will will come down to that. If they get a home draw. Or if they get a, an away draw, maybe even in France, and then a home draw in the quarter final, that might set it up. But really, we w until you see who they're playing and where they are in their own domestic competitions, there's a few of those English sides might be thinking we're not interested in this. But then there's no relegation this year in the Premiership, so that takes the pressure off the bottom teams and <laughs> the likes of London Irish and, and uh, Leicester are guaranteed home games. And they'll have seen what Bristol did last year and they'll have seen the kick Bristol got from winning a Challenge Cup and they'll be like, we'd like a bit of that. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. So it's, it will be fascinating on Tuesday to see who they're playing when the draw is made. And we await further developments on the Rainbow Cup. I suspect there'll be a lot of mixing and matching going on in that. That tournament is going to run from mid-April to mid-June by which stage nearly all the players in uh, the, the Pro 14 at least will have been playing or training for rugby for a solid year. As I drove back through the beautiful hills of Connemara from Ballon Road back the uh, Mam Crossway to Ballinahan where we are today, I just realised how much I've enjoyed uh, commentating here this season. Working with you go good fellows and all the good work you do behind the scenes. William's on production of all our commentaries. Alan engineers and gives us all the stats. But you know, you're grateful for that. And I'm kind of just enjoying this actual season performance-wise from Connacht. And let's be honest, it's been some dips, Alan. But tonight, there's a lot of positives. So let's finish on some of the positives that you picked up today. Well, 
again, we're we're competitive. We're very competitive uh, against Munster. We put them under a lot of pressure. Um, we're getting better at taking our chances. We didn't take quite enough of them tonight. Um, we're making less mistakes in games like that when the pressure came on. We didn't fold. You know, if you look at it, it took it took three attempts, I think, for Munster to get their first try. Um, that wasn't happening earlier in the season. Um, you can see there's growth. You can see there's belief. You can see that Connacht are getting better and better slowly but surely and, and to finish second in the conference would be to me is huge considering we average seventh or eighth every season you know so if you were to take the conference and put them all together we'd be fourth yeah. you know so we've finished seventh or eighth is our normal finishing position and below um, and we've only the only other time we finished above that was when we won the championship so we're we're there thereabouts um, and getting better all the time yeah I think it's fair isn't it yeah I think so um I think there's been some, like it's been an unusual season. Connacht have been winning a lot of away games and struggling at home, um, which is not really what they probably planned at the start of the season where they wanted to make the uh, sports ground a fortress. Um, some of the away performances have been very good. I think one of the key things for them tonight is that they stuck to their system. They they mm. they had belief. That's, it. It. That's why I feel positive about this because I'm picking out some negatives, the penalties they gave away moments, but it overall, yeah, there was a structure there. Yeah, and they stuck to it. Yeah. And at times this season, they've gone off mm. field. And modern rugby doesn't really work like that. You, you, you've trained all week with a plan. Um, Andy Friend talked about it in a, in a recent defeat where he said it looked like there was 15 players out there. They weren't all together. And it's important that when it's, the going gets tough that everybody's on the same page. And that's what it looked like tonight. Um, I would love to have seen them keep the ball a little bit more in hand. I think they are a dangerous side when they do that. I think some sides defend it quite well. But Munster didn't seem very happy when Connacht were running at them. And if you keep that pressure on sides, they make mistakes, they give you penalties, they let you move. You know, Clote got his, his, his yellow card because... Connacht were tearing into them and he knew what he had to do. If he didn't do that, Connacht were going to score a try. So it's that's something I think they have to keep looking at. Keep the ball in hand as much as possible. It's the game they talk about playing. So a little bit more of that. I think against Edinburgh, that'll be key. We hope hope it's a dry breeze, a bit of wind probably, but if it's a dry night against Edinburgh, really go at them, stretch them. They're a big, awkward old side and uh, Connacht beat them. In, in Scotland this year, so they'll be look, or this season, so they'll be looking for the double. Yeah, but I know you want, we want to keep the ball in hand, but what they were trying to do is make sure they were doing it in the right place, which was in the 22. In their 22 is when we were getting those penalties. We were forcing the mistakes and upping our game because they talk about it, because I was fascinated by this earlier in the season, they talked about conserving their energy for the right parts of the game. And if you watch when we get into the 22, that's why we've been better this year at scoring from inside the 22 because we've conserved our energy by not trying too hard in non-dangerous parts of the field. Then we get into the 22 and up our game. I have a question to you because I didn't get to ask you just during the commentary, but I saw you going, yes, during the commentary a couple of times when kind of kicked the grass down the middle early in the game. You were happy with our kicking game to a large degree. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. Because if, you, if, if you're kicking into the opposition half or opposition 22 and the ball bounces... That's a victory. Mm. That's a small, tiny victory, but it's a victory because it means you've got a chance to get your defensive line and move it all forward. It means they have to slow down. It means they have to walk backwards further. If you're kicking and it's landing into their hands, that's when there's a problem. And we did it a couple of times. And, and the only one that really failed was the banana kick that Jack tried and it, it just didn't turn quite quickly enough for him. I think him. he has such high success rate with that. Yeah. that. That's why he's so revered for his footballing skills because most players can't take it to that level so then they can't try it and then they're kicking the ball away in stupid positions. And, and if you look at the try in the second half came from a kick by Jack. And the try they nearly scored when Wooden gave away the penalty. We can argue about that one at the end of the world. That, to me, that was never a penalty. It was <laughs> never a penalty. It was a great kick from Porch. He couldn't have been any closer to the ground. I don't know what Wooden's meant to do with his arm when he goes to grab a guy who then slips and falls into him. How can you well, give a penalty away? I tend to disgrace. Well, and, and, the arm came then, over the shoulder. It and, just and then to follow that, and this is not to get at the referee, but to follow that, 
he he warns the scrum half for throwing a dummy. That is a straight free kick. Yeah, I'll free kick you the next time. How about trying it the first time, Chris? Again, we were always saying this. We're not giving out because Chris Busby no, no, looks like he looks like a hugely uh, po- uh, uh, and and hugely talented referee with real good the future. Players seem to, the players seem to enjoy. Yeah. Very good communicator. Yeah, except for that moment. <laughs> apart from that one. But even then, he still. But even if you look at it, he still went and told the scrum half not to do it again. It's something I used to yeah. do if I was refing games. And I liked and this conversation with Bundy at the end, and actually Bundy, Bundy's reaction to him was brilliant as well, because I just felt both people felt they were having a fair conversation. I think we've done enough on this. Yeah. Listen, we've talked for a while, for a reason, because that game actually just filled me with a lot of energy, and that's the best way I can describe it. And if rugby entertains us like that, it's not always about winning or losing. I, I don't think you're coming away too negative. Onwards and upwards, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it sets up next Saturday night now at home. That's that's what it's done. I mean, I don't think they were ever realistically... If they'd won tonight, it would have been great. Yeah, and it'd be nice to take it to the last day and all that, but they were never going to catch Munster. No, because no, I think Munster will take Benetton at home next week. Scarlet's as well, then. Yeah, but they've already done it. They've, they, they've sorted out what they wanted, which was they're in the final. Um, they probably hope it's Ulster they're playing, because if they're playing Leinster, they won't beat them. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um... But <laughs> that, that, that's that's to be decided. Connacht have to take out of this what they can. Um, but I think it'll be interesting. I think Connacht will go... I I will be asking them at some stage, do they go back and look at a game like this maybe in six weeks' time when there's a gap? Yeah. Do they go back and say, let's just really break... They, they analyse it even further. I like that concept. I'd love to know if they did that, yeah. Because... It's games like these. Yeah. If you want to be at the top level, you've got to find a way to win games like these. The absolute top, top... And what I would say to you on your structure point is they could easily go back to this game in another context on a positive sense and say, what did we do right in that game oh, as much will. as negative? Yeah. Well, they will, absolutely. I, I think all of the analysis is based on pluses and minuses. I don't think they just sit there. Unless you've, you know, if you've, if you've lost 36-7 or something, then it's going to be a lot of minuses and missed tackles. They, they, they look at this game in the round. You could tell how disappointed they were. Pete Wilkins was absolutely Jack got it. Walked away from everyone just for a second to just compose himself. Yes. To clear his head because he was probably ready to scream. Also seems to be coming back to his very best. He does. He does. He made at one stage he, he covered. There was a kick came across the field and he there was a winger. He was up against the winger and he outdid the winger and grabbed hold of the ball. He got dragged into touch but he stopped a, yeah, exactly. an almost definite try there um, and did very well. For me, we are now competitive with the Irish, the other Irish teams. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah, yeah. Not just once in a while. Yeah, now we're or the S, yeah. like dominated Ulster in the first half and blew it in the second half. Well, so we'll well, talk about that. We picked the ring. We the didn't look wins. at the win. Yeah, yeah and but you know, the like the as bad as that disappointment was, it was a close game. And then the monster to two games were one score games right to the very end. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Just like one other round. Of, like fun- sorry, if you, when you think about it, like you're, you're going to Munster. Munster are a top four or five team in Europe, and we're down and we're getting to within a. What we will say is a dodgy call against Bundy, but you know it was a good call against Bundy, or a you know a one dodgy kick went across the middle of the field and opened up the game for for Haley. That's how close we came to beating Munster. Two away wins or two away defeats all season, and like ones in Paris against Racing, ninety two in an epic game, and another's in Tolman Park by three points. So yeah, that's not bad going. Just if you're watching back that game, and there's some people may watch it back, just. Like exactly, William was going to point, was right to point out that Jack Hardy wasn't ten out of ten. But I just think he did some small things in that game that are virtually world class. He stopped a chip ahead at one stage that defied logic how high he got up in the air because it was his awareness that there's no one behind him. No one has the awareness he has. And as William brilliantly pointed out in the commentary, his footwork to regather himself and somehow catch a ball that was around his hips. I mean, it's just I just think. The Jack Carty is on top form right now. And obviously there are things that you'd like to tidy up. And by the way, that footwork came because Bundy Aki frightened the life out of Munster. Three guys were going to tackle him because they thought he was going to get the ball. That's why there was so much space out wide. Where did they get that memory from? They probably watched him against Ulster earlier in the season in the Aviva Stadium. OK, that's it. Will talk to you in a week. You're going to be you're going to update people during the week on the draw for Goy FM. I'm sure that'll come up in the podcast. Too. I'm sure it will, and we'll have some some audio, and uh, we'll uh, be ready to uh, welcome Edinburgh. Loose, cut it loose, break out, or nothing changes. Sad and confused. Don't wait until.